Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi. Now we're going to discuss the management of organ confined prostate cancer with Mark Soloway, professor of urology, University of Miami, and truly an internationally renowned urologist. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. Okay. Now let's assume a patient has had an elevated PSA, uh, biopsies done, the patient rolls in for prostate cancer, and it's only confined to the prostate gland itself. What would you recommend? Well, the first thing is, how do you know? How does one know that it's confined to the prostate? And you don't know for, with any mm -hmm. degree of certainty. Uh, with any cancer, it can be underestimated, understaged. Mm. And we don't have wonderful tools like we have with a kidney, for example, to look into the gland and to know where does that prostate cancer begin and end. Mm -hmm. The prostate cancer almost always is located on the periphery of the prostate. Mm. Now, you can feel the prostate, but that's, this day and age, not terribly sensitive or mm -hmm. specific to tell you where the cancer is. In fact, I did a study a number of years ago, having taken out the prostate, felt the prostate in my hand, and say, where is the cancer? My batting average was 50%. Mm -hmm. That's what it is in my hand, much less a rectal mm -hmm. exam. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's far from perfect. However, we do know certain prognostic factors which tell us that the cancer is most likely still in the prostate. And they are the Gleason grade, going mm -hmm. from six up to 10, the lower the number, six or seven, versus a higher number, eight, nine, and 10, much more likely that the cancer cells are still confined to the prostate. Mm -hmm. The PSA, if it's less than 10, mm -hmm. much more likely it's confined to the prostate than it's over 10. Mm -hmm. And the number of biopsies that are positive, mm -hmm whether the seminal vesicles, which usually you can't feel, but if you feel hardness there, that would be a worrisome sign. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of things that one can uh, indicate. But most of the time, as you indicated, this day and age, because the PSA has been used as opposed to symptoms to pick up the diagnosis of prostate cancer, that we think it's confined to the prostate. So then the treatment decision is either, there are multiple treatments now, mm -hmm. but let's take the two big categories if one wants treatment as opposed to just monitoring, surgical removal of the prostate or various forms of radiation therapy. Yeah. And radiation therapy can be broken down into external beam radiation therapy and implantation of radiation seeds or even a combination. Yeah. So let's start with surgery. Uh, surgery is a good choice for someone who's physically fit, mm -hmm. and my feeling should be not obese, not mm -hmm. very heavy, because it mm -hmm. makes the technical aspect a little bit more difficult, or they can lose weight, of course. With surgery, I indicate to the individual, this can be done either with an open procedure, which I use with a kind of a very small transverse incision, much like a woman with a cesarean section, mm -hmm. or uh, increasingly people use the robot, mm -hmm. the Da Vinci robot for the procedure. The outcome is virtually the same mm -hmm. from beginning to end, whether it's done openly. The key is, I always say, it's who's driving the car, who's mm -hmm. flying the airplane, mm -hmm. not whether it's a 767, 777, right. uh, it's who has the experience. You want a good pilot. Mm -hmm. I like my hands to feel the prostate. Others feel very confident using the robot. Mm. So I think it's important. There's been a lot of marketing related to the robot. Mm -hmm. It's an expensive machine. Uh, but I don't think there's any major advantage, and most studies will indicate that. Mm -hmm. So the advantage of taking out the prostate clearly is you know what the grade is mm -hmm. finally, mm -hmm. which you don't have with radiation, sure. you're just dealing with the biopsies. You know what the status of the lymph nodes is, usually they're negative. You'll know whether the seminal vesicle is involved, and you'll know whether there's cancer on the edge, the margin. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of pathologic information, mm -hmm. which is quite accurate. Mm -hmm. The surgery itself is hospitalization of one or two days, having a catheter in because you are going to suture the bladder to the urethra that has to heal. It heals within a week and the mm. catheter can be removed. And then pretty much the patient is back driving within 10 days, two weeks, mm -hmm. and athletics within a month. I mean, mm -hmm. there really is, is a very quick recovery. Two issues though, very important. The first, used to be a major problem, much less commonly so, and that is not perfect control of urination. Mm -hmm. If the surgery is well known, is, I'm sorry, if the surgery is well performed, mm -hmm. that figure should only be about three or four percent of men. 
have a significant bother with not excellent control of urination. Mm -hmm. So that's much, much less frequent with someone who does this surgery on a very regular basis. The other one, which is not so easy to say is a breeze, is erection problems. Mm -hmm. The nerves and blood vessels that are right next to the prostate have to be perfectly preserved, right. not damaged in any way by stretching, etc., uh, or there's going to take a period of time to improve. But if the cancer is close there, you don't always know it. Mm -hmm. So we try to preserve these nerves whenever possible, but even if they look preserved, they may not be. Bottom line is, even with an attempt at preserving them, right. approximately somewhere between, depends who you talk to, and whether it's the patient or the doctor, it's hard to know perfectly what goes on in someone's bedroom. Mm -hmm. But I would say at least one in five men, mm -hmm. depending on their age, are not going to have good erections, even with the PDE5 inhibitors that are used so commonly for help with erections. So that's important. Now, if a man is 40 or 50 versus someone 70 and above, they're much more likely to have return of erections. I tell men over 70, if you have your prostate removed, although it may, erections may not be as important, but they're pretty unlikely to be anywhere near as good as they were, and most men will not have good erections, even with pills. Wow. So that's for a 50-year-old, that's a major hit, even if he's, right. someone's got to be in that 20% right. who right. don't have erections. So that's very important to emphasize. Radiation therapy is much less likely, certainly initially, mm -hmm. to give problems with erections. Mm. There can be radiation damage to those nerves and blood vessels, but that tends to be a late occurrence. Mm. So that may not occur initially, but over years, right. as you know, radiation doesn't uh, go away. They may start out with good erections, two, three, four, five years down the road, their erections start declining. And then you really know, we know it's their age, mm -hmm. some antihypertensive medication they're taking right. or what is causing, because as men age, erectile dysfunction becomes increasingly common anyhow. Okay. But the bottom line is, for treatment of prostate cancer, that is the major risk factor. It's less likely with seeds than with external beams. And the exact figures are hard to know. But the point is, it is a risk. Mm -hmm. uh, radiation therapy is being done much more precise than it was many years ago. They now have little GPS uh, seeds uh, that can be put inside the prostate. So when the fancy multi-million dollar uh, radiation therapy machines are used, they know exactly where the prostate is. The machine does. Hopefully the operator, the technician does as well. But uh, the, the uh, radiation can be positioned very nicely. One of the types of radiation is proton beam. This is often a question. Should I go off to this or this center? There are only about five places in the country mm -hmm. where so-called proton beam radiation can be used. There is no evidence that proton beam is any better mm -hmm. for the treatment of prostate cancer, for the cure of prostate cancer, than is external beam radiation therapy. Mm -hmm. So that's an important point to add. So those are the two major approaches, surgery or radiation therapy. There are some that are starting to be utilized more because we have more men with low risk prostate cancer mm -hmm. that may need no treatment. One of them is freezing the prostate. Mm -hmm. Another is using a high intensity focused ultrasound. That's not FDA approved. The cryotherapy is FDA approved. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are some complications with each. There, none of these are perfect. Again, erection problems mm -hmm. with the cryo mm -hmm. uh, is, is more common than with the HIFU, but we don't know how well the HIFU works. When would you recommend cryo versus radiation or surgery? Uh, you're not talking to someone who favors cryotherapy. And the reason for that is, I think if you're going to treat the prostate, you must treat the entire gland. Mm -hmm. There are many who would disagree. They say, look, if we know where the cancer is, let's just attack that part with freezing or ultrasound waves because we can also always do it again. And they may be correct. Mm -hmm. But my concern is, as I told you, even if I have the prostate in my hand, I don't know where that cancer is. The biopsies aren't that perfect. And we know when we take out someone's prostate and we serially sample it, often you find four or five or six areas of cancer. It's not just one area. Mm -hmm. So, if you're going to treat someone with cryotherapy, you have to freeze the entire prostate, or that's at least a common way. 
If you do that, almost all men will have significant problems with erections. I see. Whereas with surgery, I told you, depending on their age, only 20% will have a problem. Interesting. So you have all these little trade-offs. Okay. Although cryo is a lot easier, it's not an incision, uh, it's not the uh, type of procedure uh, to the extent, although it has to be done under an anesthetic. Do you find it that men struggle between the two choices, radiation versus surgery? There's no question. It is not an easy decision. Mm -hmm. It Once you fully explain it and spend the time talking about it, there are certain men, I would say the majority, that either are going to say, I want this cancer out of my body, mm -hmm. or I don't want to take surgery with a higher chance of erection problems. So most men are not on the fence after you have a thorough explanation. Mm -hmm. Now what I tr do is, and I think this is also important, and there are many groups that will help with this, it's to say, you know what, remember, there's no emergency. Talk to men who have had both. Mm -hmm. I give them a list of uh, many men who have had their prostate removed of all ages, in English and Spanish, mm -hmm. since we're mm -hmm. here in Miami, a lot of men would prefer talking about this in Spanish and a lot avail themselves. And I think that's helpful. Talk to someone who's gone through mm -hmm. that treatment. So I think that's important when you do have time to make a decision. Mm -hmm. That's very smart. What is anti-androgen therapy? And is there any role in organ confined disease? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, anti-androgen therapy is lowering the male, male uh, hormone testosterone within the gland. Mm -hmm. Prostate cancer, we don't know that testosterone affects the growth of cancer. Mm. Let me put it a different way. We don't know that men with a higher testosterone are more likely to have prostate cancer, or men were, who are given testosterone are more likely to have prostate cancer. We don't know that it causes it in any way. Mm. What we do know is if you take someone with advanced prostate cancer, which was done many, many years ago for a particular reason, and give them testosterone, the cancer will grow. Also, Charles Huggins won the Nobel Prize, one of the few urologists to win the Nobel Prize, by finding out that if you remove testosterone, the cancers tremendously shrink, mm. and you will get a wonderful response for often for many years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so by lowering the testosterone, prostate cancer can be controlled. They basically don't have the nutrition to continue to grow and actually shrink very dramatically. It's not a lifelong guaranteed treatment because mm -hmm. eventually, eventually, in most men, the cancer cells will begin to grow again despite the testosterone being low, but it works for a long time. So your question is, what about in cancers that appear confined mm -hmm. to the prostate? Is there a role for it? And the answer is yes and no. Mm -hmm. So if one has low risk prostate cancer and is going to receive radiation therapy, you would not also lower the male hormone because there are side effects to the body, we can go into that later if you want, by reducing the male hormone to what we call castrate or very low levels. Mm -hmm. However, for high-risk prostate cancer, there are very good randomized trials, meaning half of the men had the testosterone lowered and half did not, and there's a very significant benefit to having a minimum of six months, up to three years mm -hmm. of lowering mm -hmm. the testosterone with the reversible technique that is not removing the testicles, but a technique which you can stop and then eventually the testosterone will gradually return to approximately normal levels. So it's been well shown that if you have locally advanced prostate cancer, mm -hmm. then the concomitant radiation along with shrinking the prostate, the benign and the malignant part, but also the cancer will give a benefit in terms of mm -hmm. more likely being free of disease at two, three, four, five years later. And you mentioned high risk. Would you please explain to our patients who is considered to have high risk prostate cancer? Well, again, we look at our prognostic factors. So someone with high risk would be someone you feel a significant mm -hmm. cancer. Mm -hmm. Probably the prostate isn't very movable on the rectal exam. A higher Gleason score, many biopsies being positive, or a PSA above 10. All of those things would put you into the high-risk category, and when you start adding more biopsies versus less, then you can uh, arrange people into these prognostic groups. So let's say a patient of yours has either opted surgery versus radiation. How do you follow them after that? PSA, there, there's no doubt the mm -hmm. PSA is wonderful. We have a serum marker, the prostate-specific antigen, that just doing a blood draw tells you what's going on. So after surgery, 
the PSA must be zero. Mm -hmm. Usually it'll be read as less than 0 0.1. Could be up to maybe 0 0.1 and not going up further. If it's that number, you're great. There's no cancer. Mm -hmm. So you just do that periodically, PSA zero, they're smiling, you're smiling, mm -hmm. we have a success. Mm. If the PSA starts increasing, then one has the dilemma, okay, that means there are prostate cancer cells in the body, mm -hmm. where are they? And then you have to make the tough decision, are they where the prostate was? If so, then radiation therapy is an excellent and very successful treatment. If they're elsewhere, then radiation therapy won't do much or anything, mm -hmm. and then you'll have to have the serum testosterone lowered and hormone therapy will be the treatment. Likewise, after radiation therapy, the PSA is not quite as good because you still have a prostate. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be some PSA. Mm -hmm. But if you have radiation therapy that's successful, the PSA ought to come all the way down to approximately 0 0.5 and stay there. If it starts to rise, then you get nervous. And eventually you might have to biopsy the prostate to see if there's prostate cancer still there. So when you say it begins to rise, at what length and what number do you start to get nervous at? You're talking about after radiation yes, therapy? Yes. There's really no perfect number. But if it's mm -hmm. continuing to rise and a steady rate, it's not due to benign glands. I see. It's due to prostate cancer. You have to assume it's prostate cancer and then either do a biopsy to confirm it mm -hmm. or to say, you know, the PSA is up to three, four, it's going up, begin hormone therapy. I see. So if the biopsy comes back negative for cancer, what do you do then? If it's continued to go up, uh, I know that cancer is not local. It's mm -hmm. going to be somewhere in the body. I see. And then we discuss at what point to intervene with hormone therapy, reducing the male hormone. So let's get back to the hormone therapy. What are the side effects of hormone therapy? The side effects of hormone therapy vary quite a lot among individuals. Mm -hmm. I've had, for instance, a, a gentleman stands out, he was 77, his PSA was going up after surgery, I think it was in the three or four range and they were very nervous. He had one shot of an LHRH analog, which is an injection mm -hmm. which uh, will uh, go to the pituitary gland, mm -hmm. block the stimulus from the pituitary that tells the testicle to make male hormone testosterone. And by doing that, again, within three or four weeks, the testosterone is at, quote, almost castrate levels. For this gentleman, there was a dramatic change in his personality. He got very depressed, and his wife really had difficulty dealing with him. Mm -hmm. We stopped it. Fortunately, it only had one injection mm -hmm. and reversed. But he had a very profound benefit in his cancer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and didn't need to be treat retreated mm -hmm. for some period of time. And then we used a different medication. Uh, an antiandrogen. So there's a dramatic example. So what are the side effects? Mm -hmm. Weight gain, mm -hmm. uh, mood changes, mm -hmm. muscle mass loss, mm -hmm. obviously decreased libido, right. loss of erections as a rule. Those would be the main uh, bone loss. So there are many effects on the body related to lowering the male hormone. Now many men, particularly older men, Oh, and hot flushes, which right. are a nuisance, right. uh, will say, you know, I really don't notice anything. And others really are bothered by one or more of these. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's rather variable. Are they severe? No. Is uh, compared to chemotherapy, it's, it's a piece of cake, right. really. Right. But yet, it's not something you would use if you could avoid it. Yes. And so for many men, getting back to clinically localized, the goal, I think, when you've diagnosed them then is to avoid during their lifetime hormone therapy mm -hmm. as a major objective. So mm -hmm. someone who's, let's say, on active surveillance, your goal is to make sure you treat them mm -hmm. so therefore in their life they don't have to have hormone therapy because you're, you have a local treatment initially and eventually if the cancer spreads, then local treatment won't cure them. Sure. So you always have to have that in the back of your mind. You want to avoid hormone therapy. I see. What if the PSA begins to rise even when one is on hormonal therapy? What does that mean? That means the cancer is not perfectly responding. The cancer mm -hmm. has learned to grow despite the testosterone being low. So the first thing to do is make sure your testosterone is very low. Then usually what we do is we will add an antiandrogen to block the 
testosterone coming from the adrenal gland. Mm -hmm. And there are pills that will do that. Yeah. And just over the last couple of years, these pills have got smarter and smarter. So we now have a three or four medications mm -hmm. that will block the extra male hormone in the body, those not just coming from the testicle, but from the adrenal gland also. Exactly. So that is usually the next step if the PSA is going up despite having the testosterone at a very low level. If those don't work, fortunately chemotherapy, uh, the taxane, has been very effective. Most men, I would say well over the majority, uh, will have an excellent PSA decline as a result of chemotherapy. And that usually will sustain people for a couple of years. And there are now other chemotherapeutic agents mm -hmm. that are coming on board also that work in prostate cancer. I see. So there's a new controversial treatment it's called Provenge Spinal Cell T. What are your thoughts on that? Well, Provenge, as you know, is a uh, presumably an immunologic approach to prostate cancer. Without going through a lot of logistics, how it's done, it's a uh, several week course, three infusions. The key part of it, which I have a little trouble with, is that every other treatment we have for prostate cancer lowers this PSA that we've been talking about for quite a while. Provenge does not do so. So that makes me concerned that what's happening there. However, when the randomized trial, men who received Provenge lived four months longer than those who did not have Provenge and it's a randomized trial, right. so that's why the drug is approved, and I think it's going to take probably a few years to know how successful it is, what, in the general population, how many men respond. I see. So the school's out. I see. And when do you begin to refer the patient to a medical oncologist like myself? Right. So I feel very comfortable in carrying someone through the various types of hormone treatment. Once it uh, gets to chemotherapy, mm -hmm. The main part about that, I, many years ago I was involved, in, particularly in bladder cancer, but also in prostate cancer, giving my own chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Before there were wonderful medical oncologists who said, look, I'm going to do GU oncology and, mm -hmm. and really took an interest in mm -hmm. it. Because the urologist is well aware of this, the local problems, the voiding problems, whether the kidney's obstructed, da da da. And uh, one can if, learn about the chemotherapy and hormone therapy. But my feeling is once you're starting to more different toxicities where the blood pressure might be altered, mm -hmm. uh, for example, with renal cancer would be a good example, and where you have to be basically at a telephone all the time. Mm -hmm. So I never would want the situation as a surgeon, I'm in the operating room and some mm -hmm. patient's white count is, has dropped and, or has a fever and is coming to the mm -hmm. emergency room, et cetera. So I think most urologists, not all, but the great percentage, once the PSA is going up, despite hormone therapy, mm -hmm. uh, we'll refer to medical oncology. Now, that may change a little bit because now there are oral medications right. that are quite successful, and they're somewhere between the standard antiandrogen mm -hmm. and chemotherapy. True. So some urologists, probably more, will start becoming familiar. But they, again, they have side effects, adrenal uh, deficiency, mm -hmm. et cetera. So, Unless one feels very comfortable, I think the medical oncologist who's attuned to GU malignancies mm -hmm. is still quite appropriate to take over the care of these patients and work with the urologist, of course. Is it difficult to say bye to someone that you've been taking care of for 10 well, years? Well, you don't say goodbye to No, I don't. I see. It's one of the great things about urology. Most of the time, even with prostate cancer, mm -hmm. there's a happy ending. Mm, that's uh, true. That, that rarely where our patient's going to die of the disease. And we are there for them. They're still going to have local potential local problems. Sure. Okay. So I don't say goodbye to any of these patients. Mm -hmm. They see the medical oncologist taking care of their systemic treatment, but they're going to see me. We still tend to give the LHRH analogs. We still, uh, again, monitor their voiding mm -hmm. status. We still look at their PSA, et cetera. And I like to say we keep the medical oncologist honest in certain <laughs> ways. And they do the same for us, of course. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you for watching. We hope this has been educational for you as well.